Th this is the second of the talks sponsored by RDF. A few years ago, I was at a conference and uh, taking questions at the end, and uh, I don't usually get hostile questions except from religious people, and they're extremely easy to handle. <laughs> but then I got a hostile question which was not so easy to handle. Uh, it was a very tricky and a difficult question, and I thought, who is this? It turned out to be one of those I'm an atheist but questions which are always the most difficult to deal with. It was, of course, Lawrence Krauss. Um, uh, and um, I, I didn't take very kindly to it at the time. We've since become the firmest of friends, and I have enormous respect for what he's doing uh, in the field of public understanding of science, which is the field that I recently retired from professing. He is, of course, a most distinguished physicist, uh, author of many books. He also interests himself in science generally and in the promotion of the understanding of science generally. He's recently moved to Arizona to start what I think is an extremely exciting initiative. Um, he is associate director of the Beyond Center and co-director of the Cosmology Initiative and director of the, of the New Origins in Initiative at Arizona State University. So the study of origins, origins of all kinds, right across the board from the origin of the universe to the origin of life to the origin of everything you can think of. What, a, what an amazingly exciting uh, initiative to get started at a university. I'm delighted that Lawrence is talking to us today. Uh, please welcome him. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Good. Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, actually, it's, let me just say that my friendship with Richard has been a, a unique one in many ways, but one that's caused me every time we're together to think about things slightly differently. I hope mutually. And, uh, and, a, and, a, and a true pleasure and honor to, to, uh, to, to be here. Richard asked me to talk about cosmology, um, and I originally gave, uh, I talked uh, to uh, Liz Cornwall who was organizing this and told her what I was going to talk about and, 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 and gave her several titles and she thought they were too pre depressing so she said, why don't you just make it, uh, we're all fucked. But, uh, uh, but I decided not to use that title. Um, the, uh, I put this quote up here. Well, I like to have quotes for when people when, when I'm being introduced so people have something to read. But uh, it's kind of useful, I think, because I want to, I, I'm going to talk about our modern picture of cosmology and how it's changed our view of the universe, the past, and the future. And in some sense, how that picture is clearly remarkable and far more remarkable than the fairy tales that are made up um, in most religious um, situations. And, but the key point is mystery. That's one of the things that makes science so special, I think, is that scientists love mysteries. They love not knowing. That's a key part of science. The excitement of learning about the universe. And that, again, is so different than the sterile aspect of religion, where the excitement is apparently knowing everything, although clearly knowing nothing. Now, in any case, so, so that's one of the reasons why I put this quote up here. But, um, but I am going to talk to you about a mystery story. So, um, um, now I live in, in Phoenix now, and people know what these are. I, I used to live in Cleveland, and then I had to tell people these were stars. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a picture of a globular cluster, and it's uh, a beautiful thing on a nice, uh, clear night. But what I want to talk to you about is how our picture has changed the universe so much that the really important stuff in the universe is not the stars and galaxies, but the stuff you can't see, the mysterious stuff that dominates nature. Uh, okay, so it's a mystery story, so let's begin. It was a dark and stormy night. And Einstein had just developed his general theory of relativity in 1916, at an interesting time, because he had developed that theory, which was the first theory of not just how objects move through space, but how space itself could, 
could expand and contract and be dynamical. A remarkable theory that told us that space curves in the presence of matter. And it was beautiful, and he kind of knew it was correct. But at the time, it disagreed with observation, which used to bother physicists in the old days. And, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, and the observation was that the universe was static and eternal. That was the conventional wisdom in science at the time, that the universe had been around forever and would be around forever. And his theory didn't agree with that, because his theory of general relativity suffered from the same problems that gra Newtonian gravity suffers from. Gravity sucks. It always pulls. It never pushes. And if you put stars and galaxies out there, they will not just stay there. Gravity will produce a universal attraction that will pull them together. And so he, he tried to figure out what to do, and, and he was able to change his theory slightly, consistent with the mathematical symmetries that allowed him to develop it. So I want to just show you how he did this. So I have his equations, which is a good thing to do at 9.45 in the morning or whatever. Um, but I, I do have them in a user-friendly fashion here. Um, okay. Um, this is for the biologists. No, I'm just joking. Um, is, but uh, the... Um, so it's not completely facetious because the, the, the left-hand side of Einstein's equations tells you about the geometry of the universe. How things are curved in the presence of the source of curvature, which in this case is the energy and momentum of the universe. So that's fine. And in fact, I, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I have to write the actual stuff, the Greek letters. That's much more illuminating to you, I'm sure. Uh, but so this was the theory that didn't work, that explained the universe we didn't live in, or so he thought. And so he was able to change it a little bit by adding an extra term to the left-hand side, which he called the cosmological term. That, this term on the left-hand side would produce a small repulsive force throughout empty space, so small that it wouldn't affect the Newton's laws, which of course uh, described beautifully, or developed, in fact, to describe the motion of the planets around the sun, and you wouldn't want to destroy that. So so small you'd never measure it in the solar system, but it could build up on the scale of galaxies and hold galaxies apart. And so that's, what, that's how he thought he'd save his theory. Now, shortly after he introduced this term, um, it became clear that it was a problem. And in fact, um, it, it, here's a postcard I got when I was on leave once in, in, in Switzerland, at, um, in, in Zurich. And it's from Einstein to, to uh, Hermann Weyl, who's a very famous mathematical physicist. And it's in German, and some of your German is better than mine, but this basically says, it's already 1923, and he's already saying, if you get rid of a quasi-static universe, then out with the cosmological constant. Because he realized that if the universe is really expanding, which is what we now know, and I'll talk to you about how we know that, then you don't need a cosmological constant anymore. If the universe is expanding, gravity can be universally attractive and just slow the expansion. And the big question of 20th century cosmology became, is there enough gravity to stop the expansion? How will the universe end? Will it end with a bang or a whimper? Will it end with a big crunch, the reverse of the big bang? or will expand forever. In fact, and that's the reason why I, as a particle physicist, got involved in cosmology, because I, I wanted to be the first person to know how the universe would end. It seemed like a good idea. <laughs> and you'll see where that came from. But anyway, so in 1923, Einstein said, you know, I, I wish I hadn't put it in and threw it out, but, but it was really not 1923, but 1929, when we really knew the universe was expanding. And this is the person who convinced us this is uh, someone, and I always say this, so some of you may have heard me say this before, but it's true. He, this guy always gives me faith in humanity. This is Edwin Hubble. And he began life as a lawyer and became an astronomer. And so <laughs> there is hope. Uh, and he made uh, many discoveries, and I think because I'm a little short of time, I won't talk about the biggest, one of the ones he made, but the biggest one he made, of course, was the discovery that the universe is in fact expanding, and it changed everything. And he, this is what he discovered. Now, th these are not sperm, these are galaxies. These are, uh, again, for the biologists. Um, the, uh, um, so our galaxy is here. And when we look out, we see uh, what he discovered was that all other galaxies are moving away from us on average. And those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast. Those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast, etc. And so, um, and we codify this saying velocity is proportional to distance. And um, now, what does this tell you? Okay. Well, it, it, it obviously tells you we are the center of the universe. Okay. And uh, actually, it doesn't. And, and in fact, my wife reminds me of that on a daily basis. And uh, uh, it re really means is that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions. Now, why does that, why does this ridiculous observation that where everything is moving away from us tell us that? 
And I've spent a lot of time trying to think of different ways to explain this, none of which have been particularly satisfactory, but I, this, this, I think the only way to understand it is to get outside the universe. We, uh, we're in California, it's easy to do that here. But, uh, uh, but, but let me do it this way. Here's a universe that's, that's two-dimensional and that you can stand outside of. And uh, here's, a, you know, I put the galaxies at nice uniform distances here. And, and again here, and you can see at a later time the universe is bigger. The galaxies are a little bit further apart. So if you were standing outside of that universe, it would be obvious that it was expanding uniformly in all directions. Now, what would you see if you were on that universe? Well, just pick a galaxy, any galaxy. And the way we could figure out what you'd see from that galaxy is to superimpose this image on top of this one, placing this galaxy on top of itself. Okay, what do you see? You see precisely what Hubble saw. Every galaxy is moving away from this galaxy. Those that are twice as far away have moved twice the distance in the same time. Those that are three times as far away have moved three times the distance. And it doesn't matter which galaxy you're on. Everywhere you see the same thing. Everywhere you think you're the center of the universe. So depending upon your mood, either every place is the center of the universe or no place is the center of the universe. It doesn't matter. The universe is expanding. And that really did change everything. And by the way, it had profound religious implications, at least. As met, some of you may know that in response to this and other things, the, the Pope at the time uh, and gave an encyclical that science had proved Genesis. And um, the interesting person, the first person to actually show there had to be a Big Bang was a Belgian priest who was also a physicist named Georges Lemaitre. And uh, the, the really interesting thing about Lemaitre is when, is when the Pope said that, Lemaitre wrote him a letter and said, stop saying that. Just really amazing for a priest, because he said, this is a scientific theory. You can take it if you believe in God and, to, and believe in Genesis to validate your beliefs. But you can also take it to mean that, in fact, the laws of physics take us right back to the beginning of time without God. What you take from it depends upon your religious and metaphysical beliefs. But whether, whatever you say, the Big Bang happened. And I think that's, that's, if we could just convince a lot of people of just that, that simple thing, that the universe is the way we, it is, whether we like it or not, I think we'd overcome a lot of problems in this country, and I have to waste far too much time on that. But anyway, okay, but this is a science talk, although I'll throw in little bits of commentary throughout, I suppose. How do we know the universe is expanding? It's such an important thing, I want to spend a few minutes on that. Well, we do, by, as these two guys on the, on the plane out there in, 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 uh, near Arizona say to one another, I love hearing that lonesome wail of the train whistle as the magnitude of the frequency of the wave changes due to the Doppler effect. <laughs> now, what they're pointing out is that when a train comes towards you, the train whistle sounds higher. When a train moves away from you, the train whistle sounds lower. And that same principle was used by Hubble and others. The same is true for light for very different reasons. So when we look at distant galaxies, if they're moving away from us, the light, which is a wave, gets stretched out. The longer wavelength part of light, or the red end of the spectrum, so it's called redshifted. And galaxies are more and more redshifted the further and further they are away from us. So that's how we know their velocity. The velocity is easy. How do you know distance? That's really hard. The universe is a big place. And we don't have tape measures that are that big. We have to find some, a way of determining distance without actually going to a place, and that's hard. And, um, in fact, the, one of the ways, well, we, of course, the way we do it is we use physics. We could determine the distance to the back of the room if I turned out all the lights and only one light was on and I knew it had a 100-watt light bulb by having an old-fashioned camera, which none of us have anymore, that had light meter on it. And um, if there were 100 watts there and I was receiving one watt of light here, I know how that light spreads out as one over the square of distance. And so I could determine by how much wattage I was receiving here knowing the wattage of that light bulb, how far away it was, okay? This is undergraduate or high school physics exercise. The problem is the universe isn't full of 100-watt light bulbs. If it was, life would be easier. So we have to try and find the equivalent. We have to try and find what's called a standard candle, something whose intrinsic brightness we understand, and therefore, when we look at it through a telescope, we see how bright it appears through the telescope, and we work backwards to figure out how, hard it, how far it is. That's the hard part. That's why it's been so hard to determine the rate of expansion of the universe, because it's hard to find standard candles.